Recording in prog. Sure. Yeah, I, I can call them. I take the risk. And the consult, I give you five, five minutes. We still have a minute or two. All right, before we start the session, I have a few short announcements. One is that here are some posters, and if you like, you may just take them, uh, this or this, uh, for, for any reason. There are also conference materials and bags. If you haven't got one, you can still get it. They are here. And if some of you arrived late and don't have the budget and didn't sign the list of attendees, then please uh, let me know. So that's one thing. Another thing is that we have this public lecture today at 6. It will be still in this lecture hall. As I mentioned yesterday, Marina Vyazaska unfortunately got COVID, so she couldn't come, but we will still have the lecture over Zoom. It will be shown in the screen, so you are welcome to uh, come to this lecture hall as well. And the parallel sessions tomorrow will also be just here. This room will be divided into two, so this will be two lecture halls, and the third one is just behind that wall. So everything is still in the same 
place. So, uh, so don't worry. You just have to find uh, which uh, number is which. The session number one will be in uh, in that room behind the wall. The session number two in the middle, and uh, here will be the session number three. So uh, I think that's oh one more thing I should say. Maybe you should have received, or if you have not yet, you will receive confirmation of attendance by by email. So you don't need to worry about that. So that's all. Thank you. Right. Confirmation of attendance in case you need it for whatever your own reimbursement or something. All right. So welcome back. So first talk will be by Tom Fried from UT Austin. He will talk on finite symmetry in field theory. Thank you. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me and for doing such a fabulous job here. So one of the pleasant surprises of the last few uh, years of the pandemic was the we got together with uh, my two collaborators here, Greg and Constantine, but there's a total of 20 of us, David Jordan's one of them, and formed a Simons collaboration, um, which began this last September. It's a collaboration with the title Global Categorical Symmetry. So Greg and Constantine and I decided last summer that we should try to understand what it means to have a global categorical symmetry. And that's the subject of this talk. Well, the first thing is the word global is used uh, by in field theory in contradistinction really to um, gauge symmetry. But gauge symmetry is not really a symmetry. So the word global is really redundant. Categorical, well, in mathematics, when we have more layers to structure that then can be encoded by sets and functions, the traditional language of mathematics, then we get into categories and higher categories and so on. But saying that something is categorical is just to acknowledge that there are several layers. So that word is redundant. And so really what we're talking about is symmetry. And symmetry in quantum field theory is of course a big topic, but there's one motivating idea that really guides everything I'm going to say. And that's an idea from the 19th century, it was a very big advance in mathematics, an advance in kind of structure and abstraction to abstract the notion of abstract symmetry from its concrete realizations to make the definition of a group or an algebra and study the group or algebra separate. And then whatever you learn about the group and algebra applies to all of its actions and representations. And that's really the theme here. All right, so just a few general words. Symmetry in quantum field theory is a big topic and I'm not going to pretend that what I'm discussing here covers all of that. In particular, what I'm going to discuss is for the analogs of symmetries we might think of as finite, like a finite group. So it's certainly interesting to extend what I'm going to say to what would be analogs of Lie group symmetries, but we're starting with finite groups just to eliminate some of those difficulties and see the structure. It does include homotopical symmetries, um, things like higher groups, two groups, and so on. We'll see some examples. And, um, it makes clear the framework of separating out, in a sense, the abstract symmetry and its concrete realizations makes the topological character clear. And that's what I'm going to try to convey. And at least at the end, I'll tell you uh, some recent work uh, from this viewpoint, not our work, but other people's. Um, there's not yet a paper. There will be at some point, but there are lecture notes from four summer school lectures that I gave uh, last month at Perimeter Institute, and I'll give you at the end of the talk a link if you're interested in, in more. There's a lot more there. So this is a very active subject. I just put a bunch of names. There are lots more names that could be put just to give you an idea that um, a lot is going on in this general kind of area of this kind of symmetry in quantum field theory and developing both what it is and how to apply it to learn things about specific quantum field theories. All right, so I'm going to begin by talking about 
symmetry in the form of algebras and just say some things about algebras. And these algebras in the theme of having finite symmetries, these algebras are not topological. They're not C star algebras, von Neumann algebras or anything like that. They're just algebras. Think of, for example, the group algebra of a finite group. So the abstract data that we wanna have is an algebra, clearly, but we also wanna think about the right regular module. So that's just as a vector space, the algebra, but with the action of the algebra on itself by right multiplication, it makes the algebra into a right module called the regular module. And now what does it mean to have an action of this algebra? Well, I really wanna think of it as an action of the pair A and R. It acts on a vector space. And to give that action on a vector space is really two pieces of data. So one is a left module. And the other is we have to tell what is the underlying vector space on which it's acting. And that's this isomorphism theta. So on the left here, you see what I could call a sandwich. We've sandwiched the algebra in between a right module and a left module. And, um, and when we tensor like that, the algebra action has been used on both the right and the left. There's no algebra action left. What we get is a vector space from that tensor product. And we have to recover the underlying vector space V. Let me just say a word, two words about right versus left. One is that the right and left refer to the algebra. So the right module appears here. The algebra is on the right of the right module. Second word is that my convention is that right actions are structural and left actions are geometric. So the right action, this right regular module is part of this abstract structure. Okay, so the R is allowing us to recover the underlying vector space. And it's a bit pedantic here because L is the underlying vector space is V, but in later context, you'll see that that distinction um, is not quite so pedantic. And of course, when we study algebras, for example, the universal enveloping algebra of Lie algebra, there are different elements you might identify like casimers and different relations and so on, the centrality of a casimer. And that applies, of course, and gives you information about every representation of the algebra. So the basic analogy of this lecture is the following, that algebras will be replaced by topological field theories. Topological field theories are finite in a strong sense, and that's the finiteness I referred to. And the elements of an algebra, which give you operators in, uh, in, a, in a module, those are replaced by defects in this topological field theory, and they will give us something acting on quantum field theories. So an example is, as I said, we can take a finite group, take its group algebra like that. If we identify the vector space underlying the group algebra as functions on the group, then the product is given by convolution, push forward under multiplication. There are also what we might say the word higher, higher examples of algebras, that is to say categories that are also algebras. And so here's an example, which is again, the group algebra of the group G, but instead of taking coefficients in a ring or a field, we're taking coefficients in a category, a category of vector spaces, so that's like a ring under direct sum and tensor product. And so you can think of the objects of this categorified group algebra as being vector bundles over the group G. And again, there's a, um, a composition law, which is push forward under, under multiplication. That's the convolution. And so this is an example of a tensor category. It's again, a very finite tensor category called the fusion category. Okay, I wanna say a few more words um, for later use about while we're in this context of algebras, I wanna say something about quotients and about um, projectivity. So to take a quotient, we need an extra structure on an algebra. It's what's called an augmentation. And the augmentation is a map from the algebra to the ground field, in this case, the complex numbers, which is an algebra homomorphism take sums to sums and products to products. And if we have that, then that's equivalent to saying that the ground field C is made into a module over the algebra A. And I'm going to take it to be a right module. 
So that's an augmentation. And so for the group algebra of a finite group, we have that augmentation. An element of the group algebra is just a sum of numbers times group elements, and we map it to the sum of the numbers. If we think of it as a function on the group, we're taking the push forward of the map from the group to a point. So that's the augmentation. And now the, the quotient construction is the same kind of sandwich, the same kind of tensor product, but on the, the right module is not the regular module, but rather this augmentation or the module we make from the augmentation. And we can make this plays the role of a quotient construction in the world of algebras. So again, we have this original picture, which is saying that we have an action of A on V. And then we have this new picture, which gives us the quotient, what plays the role of the quotient of that action. And here's a little example slash exercise. If we take the finite group, just acting on a finite set, you don't need finiteness for, for, for that really. Um, we can take the left module to be just the free vector space generated by the set. And that becomes a module by the group action on the set over the group algebra. And if you form this quotient, what you'll see you get is the free vector space on literally the quotient set, meaning the set of orbits of the group action. So that's an indication of why this construction is a quotient construction. Well, for these higher versions of algebras, there are also augmentations in that context. For example, for this fusion category, this categorified um, group algebra, and that in that context is called a fiber functor. The, ground, the, the role of the ground field is now played by this ring of vector spaces. All right, so last general thing I wanna say is about projectivity because quantum theory is really a projective theory. It's not linear geometry, it's really projective geometry. And the projectivity is encoded in the Hooft anomaly. I'm not going to say too much about that in, these, in this lecture, but let me just say that symmetries then of a field theory are also part of projective geometry. And that projectivity in the sense of symmetries of algebra is really encoded by the choice of algebra. So as an example, supposing that we think about a group G, say a finite group, and we think about projective representations, well, a projective action of G is a linear action of some central extension of G by the units, by the invertible scalars. And um, well, this central extension is a kind of co-cycle, if you like, it's something geometric. It has an equivalence class, which lives in some cohomology group. And that equivalence class is the measure of the isomorphism class, if you like, of this projectivity of this representation. And in terms of algebras, we can form a twisted version of the group algebra from the central extension. And those projective representations are now modules over this uh, twisted group algebra. But this twisted group algebra doesn't have an augmentation if the central extension is non-trivial, not, not split, not isomorphic to the trivial uh, representation. So that's an example where as I said, an augmentation is not something you always have to be able to form quotients, even in this algebraic setting. The same thing for the higher uh, case, these fiber functors, which are augmentations, uh, also don't always exist. I don't know why in category theory, every standard concept in algebra, like homomorphism or augmentation gets a new name in category theory, like functor, fiber functor, things like that. But there really are standard concepts from algebra. All right, so now finally we come to field theory. And I'll just start with, so things have been said in the previous talks, which is very helpful about field theory. And there are many ways to look at field theory, of course. And here's a first very crude thing to say is that a field theory is analogous in some sense to having a representation of a Lie group or a module over an algebra. Now that's a very limited kind of uh, analogy, but maybe useful uh, for some things. And uh, what it's a representation of is a Bordism category. And those are the Siegel axioms that uh, Graham introduced in the 
mid to late 80s uh, in the context of two-dimensional conformal field theory, as we heard very beautifully yesterday and also today, um, but which really apply in general. And just as when you're talking about representations of Lie group, you have to tell not only the dimension of Lie group, but also which Lie group. You don't just say, I'm studying representation of a Lie group of dimension eight. It is SU3 or it's SU2 cross SU, et cetera. So similarly, there are two kind of discrete parameters underlying a field theory. One is the dimension N, and the other one are the background fields. So the background fields might include things like an orientation, a spin structure, might include a conformal structure, Riemannian metric, a connection for some fixed Lie group, things like that local objects in n-dimensional manifolds. And the background fields will determine the character of, um, of the representation theory, meaning of the quantum field theories. So I'm going to assume that everybody has seen these Siegel axioms, and I know that because you have seen them in the previous lectures. And um, notice that I've drawn the here n minus one dimensional manifolds with a little bit of a thickening. And in topological field theory, we don't need that. But in honest kind of quantum field theory, analytic quantum field theories, everything has to be dimension n. And so there's a little thickening, which in topological field theory is remembered just on the infinitesimal level as a thickening, a stabilization of the tantrum bundle. So for topological theories, there's a notion of extended or fully local field theories where we don't just have these manifolds with boundary, but we have n-dimensional manifolds with corners of all, uh, all co-dimensions. We go and cut and paste as much as we want. And I will have in the background for topological theories, I'll be using that kind of full locality. And in principle, one should think that that's also there uh, in general theories, although that's certainly much less developed. Uh, as far as non-topological theories, there's a paper uh, within the last year, maybe, or year and a half of Konsevich and Siegel that tells some of the things one needs to do to extend this kind of axiom system beyond topological and conformal field theories. All right, so one more concept from field theory is that of a domain wall. So here we have a theory sigma one and theory sigma two, and then we can have this co-dimension one, what's well, an example of a defect going from sigma one to sigma two. And similarly, well, there's a notion of the trivial theory. If it lands in the trivial theory, we can think of that as a right boundary theory for sigma. So again, it's sigma that's on the right. And here we would have the notion of a left boundary theory. So in fact, they're analogous to the standard terms from algebra, and I'll use those terms when the theory sigma is topological at least, or at least in this context of symmetry that I'm about to tell you. So for the domain wall and for the right and left boundary theories, I'll use these terms from algebra about modules. And again, if we have a left and right boundary theory and we have sigma in the middle, we can form this sandwich, which I'll write as this tensor product. The sigma in the middle is n plus one dimensional and what we mean by this is the dimensional reduction of this n plus one dimensional theory sigma along this interval with these two boundaries colored. And so what we get is an n dimensional theory. Um, there are more general defects. Defects don't have to live on submanifolds. They can live on stratified submanifolds and we'll see that as well. All right, finally, there's Two composition laws I just want to emphasize. One is a composition law on theories. If we have two theories, we can take their tensor product. That's sometimes called stacking. And um, it's like taking two quantum mechanical systems. It is taking two quantum mechanical systems and considering them together without interaction. And there's, it's an associative composition law in a kind of categorical sense, and there's a unit an identity for that composition law. Similarly, for defects, at least on sort of parallel submanifolds, there's also a composition law. So for example, we saw this morning, if you have points, you can imagine a composition law that goes by the name of operator product expansion. So that doesn't give you 
quite an algebra in the usual sense, but if you're in a topological theory, it does. And so it gives you an algebra or some kind of higher algebra of defects. And again, there's a unit defect there. So in both cases, when you have an associative composition law and you have a unit, that's a generalization of a monoid, that structure in algebra, then you have the notion of a unit there, of a unit in the sense of an invertible element. So we have a notion of an invertible field theory and the notion of an invertible defect. All right, so that was all background. And now I can finally come to the main definitions that I wanna propose here. So supposing that we fix these discrete parameters, we'll fix a dimension N and some background fields, which uh, will remain mostly in the deep background here. And then I wanna first give a definition for what the abstract symmetry is, and then what a concrete realization is. So the abstract symmetry is a pair, just as it is for the algebra. And the pair consists of a topological field theory of dimension one higher, dimension n plus one, and a right structural, a right uh, boundary theory, which I call a right module sigma. Now remember in the algebra case, we had the notion of regular, and we'll get to the regular in a second, but an example is uh, that we'll see is if we have G a finite group, then we can let sigma, this n plus one dimensional topological theory, be the gauge theory, the pure gauge theory that counts G bundles. And um, I just wanna emphasize that this theory in the middle here is the quantum theory. We've already summed over the G bundles. So it's not the classical kind of theory where the G bundle is a background field. It's been summed over in this picture. So that's important. All right. Now, what does it mean to say that the boundary theory is regular? Well, here's a long-winded kind of explanation. And if you're versed in topological field theory, then what it says is that we should think of a fully local theory where we can evaluate on a point. And what's evaluated on a point should be an algebra for sigma. And then we can talk about the regular module in that higher categorical context. So, I'll just say that there is a notion of a regular module in that context. And um, well, Mike Hopkins and discussions with uh, us and so on, have been thinking about generalizations. But anyway, for the purposes of today, we'll just um, think about the regular module in that sense. And what's the regular module is often called Dirichlet, the Dirichlet boundary theory. All right. So the second main definition is this concrete realization. What if I have sigma and rho? What does it mean for it to act on a quantum field theory F? So supposing we're given a theory F, which is dimension N, and we wanna say that sigma rho acts on it. So what does it mean to have this structure of a module over sigma and rho? It's again a pair, the same as for an algebra. And the pair is a left boundary theory or a left module, F tilde, and then an isomorphism that allows you to say what this uh, sigma rho is acting on is our original theory F. So we need this isomorphism theta. So it's presenting F as a picture spread out over one more dimension as this sandwich uh, of the topological theory sigma sandwiched between this right boundary theory, which is also topological. So all this part is topological, very finite. And then the analytic part, the quantum field theory part is sitting here in the left boundary. So as I said, this picture immediately separates out the uh, topological from the analytic. So the theory F could be topological and F tilde could be topological, but in general, they won't be. And here I'm saying that the the topological piece is sigma and rho, and we'll be playing with defects that live there that are clearly topological. Okay. Now, one thing we'll come back to at the end is that symmetry persists under renormalization group flow. And so if you have this picture of this sigma rho module structure on your theory, and you deform the theory, say by the renormalization group, 
then you expect that what you get to still has sigma and rho acting. And so that will constrain then the low energy dynamics. That's how symmetry is used to constrain the low energy dynamics. And to the extent that the projectivity called the Hooft anomaly in this context is encoded in sigma and rho, that too will be used uh, to make dynamical conclusions. All right. So let me um, give a couple of examples. And the examples I'm going to focus on for the purposes of this lecture are very elementary quantum mechanics, because that's common ground for everybody. But the same principles work in higher dimensions. So uh, we'll be coming back to this example. But um, this example has n equals 1. So we should think that the boundaries here are one dimensional. And this f is going to be our quantum mechanical theory. And in this picture, you could think of this vertical direction as being time. The background fields here are, um, well, in quantum mechanics, we have an orientation and a Riemannian metric. So this is wick rotated time is the Riemannian length of say an interval. Um, but in sigma and rho, we actually have no background fields at all. These theories are just what we might call unoriented theories. They don't have any background field. Well, the quantum mechanics is given by a Hilbert space and a uh, Hamiltonian. That's what defines this theory F. And now we're, let's assume that there's a finite group that acts on the Hilbert space commuting with the Hamiltonian. So that's what it means to have that symmetry. And I gave a name to that action. And so that finite gauge theory now in dimension two uh, is what sits in the middle. And the theory itself is a left module, a left boundary theory for that gauge theory. So that gauge theory could be thought of as its value on a point, this two-dimensional theory, that's a very familiar theory if you've encountered topological field theory at all, is the group algebra. And what's here on a point is then uh, the Hilbert space as a module over the group algebra. And well, F itself on a point is just the Hilbert space itself. So here, just to get a feel for what I mean by this kind of picture, here are some boardisms you might like to evaluate. So this one, for example, um, you see the, the right part here is colored by this F tilde, so it only has one boundary point. And what it ends up being is the left module uh, itself. Here we have evolution from the picture that evaluates to that left module to itself, and there's a, Riemannian metric just on this part of the picture. There's no Riemannian metric in the bulk here. So that has a length tau, and the evolution is this wick rotated evolution of the quantum mechanical system. If we fold this into a cylinder, then um, we get some trace of the group action. Okay, here's another example. And this example, um, we could be in any dimension. And now we'll take A to be a finite abelian group. So here I took the example. Mu two means the group plus minus one, the second roots of unity, cyclic group of order two. Now given an abelian group, we can form its classifying space. That's an eilenberg maclean space with just pi one and every other homotopy group zero. And it's actually a classic paper of the same Graham Siegel from the 60s, but I think was known before that when you take an abelian group and take its classifying space, then that classifying space is also a group. Well, it's a group in a certain sense, kind of homotopical sense. And so you can iterate the construction and take the classifying space of BA since it's a group, then B squared A is a, is a group and so on and so forth. So we're going to, this, this uh, slide is encoding a theory with BA symmetry, with the symmetry of this group, this homotopical or shifted BA, what physicists call a one form A symmetry. But it's really this group BA that's acting as the symmetry. Um, so, as an example of a theory on which it might act, we could take a, a gauge theory with gauge group, a Lie group, which has this A as a subgroup of its center. So for example, mu2 is equal to the center of SU2, the center of SU2, 
are the diagonal matrices plus or minus one exactly mu two. And let's let H bar be the quotient group. So in this case, it's SO3. So in this case, we might look at the H gauge theory, like the SU2 gauge theory, that's the theory we're studying, but that has this symmetry, this B mu2 symmetry. And the left module here is actually the gauge theory for the quotient group. So here you see that the, it's not so pedantic that the left module and the theory are different. You see here, they're different gauge theories. And it's this one that lives on the boundary, the H bar or the SO3 theory that lives on the boundary of this topological field theory. Okay, so later we'll see how to recover the H bar, the SO3 theory by changing this um, right boundary theory. So when we're looking at it here, we have the regular boundary theory. That's the one that allows us to recover the theory we're studying, but we could change and put other topological boundaries on the right and recover other theories there. So I'll say something about that quotient construction. All right, so now let's go to defects. And I'm going to illustrate this in quantum mechanics where uh, it's easier to see. So remember that we have a Hilbert space, a Hamiltonian and a group acting on the Hilbert space linearly commuting with the Hamiltonian. What we wanna do is study point defects in quantum mechanics. You see, that's the typical thing you study in quantum mechanics. If this were an interval of length tau and we had some point defects, well, you know, we would evolve by the theory until we hit the first one, then we would have put in the operator that you get at that point, then you'd evolve some more and put in and so on, and you'd make a correlation function. Those are the basic quantities in quantum mechanics. So we want to study defects supported at this point. And how do we say what the defects are? Well, what you do is you look at the link of the point. The link is the sphere in the, no in the normal space to the point in the manifold. And um, that normal space here is a zero dimensional sphere. It's just two points. And we should evaluate the theory on those two points. And what we should do is take HOM from one into that. So those are sort of the objects that are sitting in the theory evaluated at those two points. So that's a vector space. Now, if the theory is topological and mostly we'll look at topological things, that's the end of the story. But if the theory is analytic, then we have to take a limit as the sphere shrinks. And so that kind of limit uh, is you know, what you need when it's not topological. So it's an inverse limit, a limit. And what you get is actually the vector space, you get a vector space and the vector space is some kind of operators on the Hilbert space H, but they're actually singular operators, like unbounded operators. It's exactly what you, expect in quantum mechanics. But I'm not going to focus on that aspect in this talk, so I'll just denote that end H, but keep in mind that those are really singular operators. Okay, and what we wanna look at then are how these point defects look in this picture. I mean, why is this picture of the symmetry useful? And so we're going to look at defects in this sandwich picture that map by the map theta over to point defects in the quantum mechanics. So one kind of defect here is just a point defect that might live on this right boundary theory. So that's topological. That's part of the topological part of the theory. And how do we see what the label is? Well, again, we look at the link. Now we're looking at the link of a point on a boundary of a manifold with boundary. So the link is this interval. And you see this interval, the interior is the theory sigma and the boundary is this green regular boundary theory colored by the regular module. And if you evaluate this in the two-dimensional theory sigma, topological theory, this is a one manifold, you get a vector space, and it is the vector space underlying the algebra. So in other words, the defects, what labels these point defects here are elements of the algebra. So that includes the group itself that sits inside the group algebra. And these are invertible. The group inside the group algebra are units. They're invertible elements. And so those give you invertible defects. So those are the defects sitting here. Those are the usual ones that you would read about that if you have a usual G symmetry, it's a co-dimension one topological defect. And so that's supported here. Now we could have defects supported here. Those are definitely not topological, 
those are part of this analytic theory. We can again look at the um, link. And when you evaluate that, what you'll get are operators, again, singular operators, but they're operators that commute with the G action, with the algebra. So they're exactly that kind of operator. Then we could have defects that are in the middle, point defects. And the link here is a circle. And if you evaluate the circle in this two-dimensional gauge theory, then what you get is the center of the group algebra. So basis is given by the conjugacy classes. So these are really central defects. And again, they're topological because they're living in this topological part of the theory. Okay. So we still haven't seen the most general point defect and the general point defect will be the image under this theta of this line defect, this one dimensional defect, but this one dimensional defect is now on a manifold with boundary, kind of stratified manifold. So when I wanna figure out how to label the defect, we have to work from the top strata on down. And so we have to look at the link of a point in the middle inside this topological theory. Then we have to look at these boundaries and the link here will now contain what we chose at the higher strata. And so by the time you do that, you'll see that there are three pieces of data, this bimodule, this vector, and this map. And um, under the isomorphism, well, you'll see you'll get a general operator that way. So that's how the defects get spread out. Now, okay, there's a composition law in these defects, and that's a familiar picture. If we had two points in the middle, we wanna bring them together like this to compose. Well, we have to look at what the links do. The links are these two circles which come together. And of course that gives us the pair of pants and that pair of pants evaluates to the um, composition law on uh, those central defects. If we take two points here and we bring them together and we look at the links, these intervals, these intervals come together. And so that makes this pair of chaps. That's what cowboys wear. And, um, and that gives the composition law on those kinds of defects as well. Anyway, you can compute all these things. So let's just think about how these defects commute because that's one of the properties. For example, these defects here, remember, are labeled by elements of the um, group or elements of the algebra, the group algebra. And a defect here, I can't move, right? A defect here is one that's, um, th these are the defects that are singular operators, but that commute with the group action. But they're not topological, I can't move them. But this one I can move, and you see that when I move it, nothing happens, it doesn't interact with this guy. So it clearly commutes, which is the statement, right? If you go back to the picture where we project that onto, um, onto the quantum mechanics by this operation theta, you'll see I'm moving one defect past the other, but they clearly commute in this picture, as does this defect. And this defect commutes with this one as well. That's the saying that it's a central defect. Now, of course, this defect doesn't, these two don't commute with each other. We can compose them using that law, and then we can see that the composition in the other order um, you know, also works as long as I change the label to be the conjugate here. So you'll see that moving G past A uh, ends up conjugating A, it acts G on A. So I'm just showing you this to emphasize that these are all calculations inside topological field theory, and we have a very well-developed theory of topological field theory, and so we can do these computations. So for example, if I want to take this point defect labeled by a group element, this invertible defect, and commute it past this general defect, well, all that commutation is happening in the topological part of the theory. So even though the defect we're commuting past is not topological and it doesn't commute with G, we can see its effect by what's going on in the topological field theory. I'm very conscious that, how much time do I have left? Five. What's good is I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see. Okay. Um, so let me skip then. Um, Okay, so let me say something about quotients then. And so 
I've told you what an augmentation is, and here we have an augmentation of a higher algebra. So that's something for this topological theory sigma. And um, now we wanna know what's an augmentation of the whole theory sigma. And so again, if we're in this situation where we can evaluate on a point and essentially use the cobordism hypothesis, then we can just transport that notion from algebra to these topological field theories. So these are called also Neumann boundary theories, these augmentations. And as I've said before, they don't always exist. But if it does exist, then we can use the augmentation to, as I said, replace this regular or Dirichlet boundary by this um, augmentation or Neumann boundary. And in that way, we can define what we mean by the quotient. So this is usually called gauging, but that word I think has different connotations. So let's just call it quotient. So this is the quotient operation in um, field theory, if we have this augmentation. And as I said, something like an Hooft anomaly would obstruct the existence of that augmentation. Well, if we have that, then there are actually domain walls that go between the theory, which is here, this green uh, Dirichlet, a regular boundary theory. Then we can go to this augmentation and then back here. So again, this is purely in the topological part of the theory. So something we can control with topological field theory. But under theta, that becomes a domain wall from the theory F to the quotient F mod sigma, and then the adjoint domain wall that goes back to the theory F. So naturally we wanna compute the uh, composition of those. And the composition is then a self domain wall of our original theory F. Well, you can see here how the computation would go using these links, as I said before. And um, okay, but I guess before I did that, we can also put um, this quotient construction uh, on a submanifold. And so, um, right, so we can make what's called a quotient defect, sometimes called a condensation defect. So it's again living just on this uh, regular boundary part of the theory. And it's something where you, get this kind of picture where you put the uh, augmentation in a tubular neighborhood of this uh, submanifold and the rest is where it is. All right. Yeah, so I'm running out of time. I um, wanna say that there's a class of topological field theories that comes up very often. The ones that I'm talking about in this lecture of this type, it's also a very good playground for general concepts. These are called finite homotopy theories. And for these theories, one can really calculate using methods of topology. Again, I'm not in time to, to say that. But let me get to the last part, which is um, this business about constraining dynamics. So at least you can see how this picture works in one particular example. So um, supposing we have a theory we'll think of as an ultraviolet or short distance theory, and suppose it has a symmetry, sigma and rho. As I said before, under renormalization group flow, that symmetry should persist. So whatever is in the infrared should have that symmetry. Now, if the theory is gapped, then the usual statement is that what's in the infrared is a topological field theory. And um, so that topological field theory will now be constrained to have a sigma rho module structure. And we can use methods of topological field theory to investigate that. That's now purely a topological problem. It could happen that this theory is invertible. That's the case of a kind of unique vacuum. That's the case that physicists call trivially gapped, the trivial meaning that it's invertible. And if it's trivially gapped, well, that's the thing that we're going to, in fact, obstruct. And um, so saying it's trivially gapped is saying it has an invertible module is more or less saying that there's an augmentation in that situation. And so this is really a question, again, of the existence of augmentations. So here's our standard situation now. We have this symmetry, 
this theory sigma, this n plus one dimensional topological theory, this right regular boundary theory, we have an augmentation, we have it acting on F, and here we get the quotient. That's the setup we've had before. But now suppose in addition that after we take the quotient or this gauging, we have somehow an isomorphism with F. And so this is a domain wall in this direction from the quotient back to F. And recall that we had a domain wall from F to F mod sigma. And so in this situation, when we have this, that's very special, then there's a defect called the duality defect, which is the composition. And so that's a self domain wall from the theory F to itself. And this domain wall is topological because you see it's the composition of delta. Delta was living over on that green wall. So delta is topological and this phi is just an isomorphism. It's not just a relabeling if you like. And we can compute the composition of delta followed by its adjoint. And because this is an isomorphism, it cancels out. And what we get is the composition that I said we had before, which is this purely topological composition. So let me conclude then with an example of that, just to show you. So let's take n equals four. So we're studying four dimensional theories, in fact, four dimensional gauge theory. And we'll study the ones with a B mu two symmetry, which means that the theory in the middle is a kind of gerb theory. You're counting gerbs or elements of uh, H2 with coefficients in that group. Okay. So this finite homotopy theory picture allows you to compute what the composition of these topological domain walls is. And what it is, is roughly a three-dimensional gauge theory with this gauge group mu2. But if we have this, um, th this invertible module, that would be the case of trivially gapped, then the domain wall is actually exactly multiplication by three-dimensional gauge theory. So when you act on something one-dimensional, you always act by a multiplication operator. And so in this sense, it decouples from whatever lambda is, we don't have to know. This is actually multiplication by that theory. All right, so that's again, that slide was all in the topological part. I didn't say anything about what it's acting on. That's an example of separating the abstract symmetry from any concrete realization. Now let's suppose we have a concrete realization. We have a quantum field theory on which it acts. And we have this situation, this rare situation when the quotient is equipped with an isomorphism back to the original. So here's an example. We could take four dimensional U1 gauge theory with a coupling constant tau, the upper half plane. And it has this symmetry because this mu2 is in the center. The whole group is uh, it's a Delian group. And when we take the quotient, we get again a U1 gauge theory but the coupling constant has shifted. And what this map is, is S-duality, which again, sends us back to a U1 gauge theory, but with a new constant. And if we wanna equate these, then that particular value equates them. So that theory at that value is an example. We could also take SO3, four-dimensional gauge theory with the theta angle equal to pi. That's another example. So I'm not going to use any details of the gauge theory, what it has, except to know that it has this symmetry. So what is this duality defect then? Well, this duality defect, I said, is a kind of square root in the sense that it composed with its adjoint is uh, this three-dimensional gauge theory. But there is no such square root. And that's easy to see from topological field theory. For example, that three-dimensional mu2 gauge theory evaluated on a point is exactly this categorified group algebra of this group of order two. It has two simple objects, so you can't have a tensor product of two things. I mean, it's not a square. So we certainly can't have that. And so the conclusion is that this gauge theory is not trivially gapped, no matter what matter or so on you put, as long as you, you keep that symmetry, that's the argument. So it's, it's a very simple argument based on symmetry that, um, that, that you can make, and then it applies quite generally. All right, so I think I'm out of time. I know I'm out of time. And um, here are some links. So as I said, I gave lectures, and there's quite long lecture notes about this topic. 
um, which you could find at the top link. Um, there's also a lot of material from the school we had about related things uh, at that website. And there's our collaboration website. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> So, any question? Uh, so, can I have examples of uh, F tilde, uh, which carry defect operators, uh, uh, which are topological, but do not come from the ends of uh, something in the bulk? But do not come from what? Ends of something in the bulk. Ends from something in the so can it just have topological operators on F tilde? Yeah, F tilde can be a topological field theory. So for example, the what David Jordan was talking about in his talk uh, yesterday um, would be an example. Any more questions? Any question for Montana? No. Otherwise, thank you.